Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today for this topic, topic seven. We're gonna chat a little bit about some of the structural properties of structural civil materials used for construction purposes. I wanna thank you so much for being here for it. You could have been anywhere else really to dedicate your time and you chose to spend it watching this video and the ones linked from it, so let's get started. Lovely. So uh, this is what we're going to cover today. Think of this as an agenda. It's going to be a lot about some terminology that we use in structural engineering as it relates to the construction materials that we use and the properties that are important uh, related to these construction materials for the purposes of structural engineering. So it might be a bit of more of a boring type lecture. So this is what we're going to be chatting about. We're going to use stress, strain, elasticity, plasticity, modulus of elasticity, we're gonna chat about axial stress, bending stress, shear stress, bearing stress, buckling, and then touch on safety margins and factors of safety. Now, the nice thing about the video is that you can watch it and view it as many times as you need, as you want, and it's always there for you. Furthermore, there are gonna be links in the video itself that relate to additional videos that support what you'll see today. I just didn't wanna make this video too long. The content of this video will be uh, more or less following what's in chapter four of your textbook, I recommend you check it out, okay? Now, stress. We've used this term quite a bit throughout the term for the purposes of these topics. It's been used before. Uh, stress is an engineering property that's defined by the fraction of force by area. Stress is equal to force divided by area. The units, the metric units, are typically kilonewtons per meter squared, also known as kilopascals or KPA, or newtons per millimeter squared, also known as MPA or megapascals. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna link for you an example at the bottom that uses both metric and imperial units of calculating stress. I do wanna remind you that the units for imperial purposes, uh, the imperial units for uh, stress are usually pounds per square foot or PSF, or pounds per square inch, or PSI, or kips per square inch, which is KSI, with a reminder that kips is a kilopound or a thousand pounds. So check out the example at the bottom that I've linked for you under a separate video. Now, the direction of the force on the area in question, on the element in question, makes a difference in terms of what kind of stress we're looking at, okay? So let's say we have this long cylinder uh, and that we have an applied force on it that tries to elongate the cylinder. It's pulling on the two faces of the cylinder in the same direction as the length of the cylinder, okay? What do we call this? Yes, it's axial stress because the forces uh, are trying to elongate this element. So tensile stress is what's happening on this member because we have a force that's acting on that circular surface, okay? If we had forces pushing in this direction, we have compression. That's because this element is trying to be shortened by the applied forces. In this case, we have an axial stress, right? Because the forces are going through the axis of the member, trying to go through the member itself, and it's in compressive force. <clears throat> now, I bring this up because also this represents the way that we test some of the more popular construction materials. Concrete on the left of your screen, steel on the right of your screen. We test the properties of concrete and steel used in construction by doing these axial stress, axial tests. So for concrete on the left, you see we have our cylinder that gets crushed in compression to see what its capacity is so that we may predict how we will behave in a building. For steel, we do a tensile type te test on a coupon to see what its property might be so that then we can use it for the purposes of say beams, columns, reinforcing, and what else. Strain is another topic that we should be familiar with. The definition of strain is change in length divided by original length. So you can see here in figure 4.9 that I took by out of your textbook. 
If you do the fraction, the division between the change in length and the original length of the element, whether in tension or compression, you obtain strain. The interesting thing is that the units between change in length and original length are the same. So whenever you put property, uh, quantities in here, you have to make sure that the units are the same for both quantities, okay? So there is gonna be an example that I'm gonna link for you on doing this, and it's gonna be linked for you at the bottom. But here's the important thing, okay? You wanna make sure that the units match because if they don't, you can't do the fraction of the change in length by original length. Furthermore, strain has no units, right? Because the units cancel out. So to make more sense of the results, as you'll see on the example linked for you below, the strain example, it's convenient to multiply the answer of strain by 100% so that the answer is a percentage number. How does this help us? We'll see it in a moment once we get to ductility and brittleness. Ultimate stress, ultimate strain are exactly the same as stress and strain, except that, I'll show it here for the purposes of stress, the applied force is that one force that you apply on that material that causes its failure, okay? So whenever you apply a force and divide it by an area, it's stress. If that force is the force that causes failure in that material, then it's ultimate stress. The units are exactly the same uh, as they were for regular stress, right? Non-ultimate stress, if you will. And the same is true for strain. Now, what is the difference between ductile and brittle material? For ductile material, we call it such if that material undergoes significant deformation before it fails, right? If you put a force on it and the deformation of that material, the change in shape or length of that material is significant before failure. An example of that is steel. That's a common ductile material used in construction, okay? Brittle is different. A material that undergoes very little or no deformation, negligible deformation is considered brittle. Right? If this deformation happens before failure and it's super small, it's brittle. Concrete is an example of that. The way to figure this out usually is to plot the stress-strain relationship on a graph, on our Cartesian coordinate of graphs, uh, the way you see it here. I took these figures straight out of your textbook. The one on the left shows a typical stress-strain curve for steel, uh, structural steel. And on the right, you see an example for concrete. Now, again, the one on the right is for concrete, not reinforced concrete. Now, how do we tell the difference though between ductile and brittle material? We're using qualitative words like significant deformation or negligible deformation. This is an engineering type topic. We need to be more specific. Well, duct ductility and brittleness of a material are actually measured in strains. Ductile material has a strain, an ultimate strain, that's more than 5%. Brittle material has an ultimate strain that's less than 5%, okay? So that's how you can tell the difference whether or not your material is ductile or brittle. Now, the difference between elasticity and plasticity in terms of construction materials. Well, for both. If you apply a force to that material and that material deforms, whatever it might be that you're thinking of, and then you remove that force from that material, does that material recover its shape? The answer is either yes or no. If the answer is yes, that material is elastic. If the answer is no, that material is plastic. Okay? All right. Modulus of elasticity. Modulus of elasticity, turns out, is defined as the slope from the stress-strain curves. Okay, now I know that you learned how to calculate the slope of a curve. I'm showing it here graphically on the stress strain curves for concrete and steel. I will never test you on being able to do that. That is, being able to find the stress strain curve, sorry, being able to find the slope on the stress strain curve, but you should be aware of where it comes from. The units for the modulus of elasticity are exactly the same ones as stress. And what does it represent? Well, it represents, it's a measure of the stiffness of that specific material. It's a measure 
of that material's uh, elasticity, springiness, if you will. Another way that this property is also known, and known as is Young's modulus, okay? All right, so now uh, going back again to axial stress, that is the stress that you get when you apply a force, either tension or compression, along the axis of the member, as if you're going through the member or pulling through the member. What's happening in both cases, the only way you can have axial stress is if the amount of force, whether tension or compression, I'm showing compression in this case, is uniform over the face you're applying this to, right? So you can see in this schematic, the force that's being applied in compression is the same force on that whole uh, rectangular face. When that force is not uniform on the face, you have bending. So one way to look at this is this, right? If you have a force that's not even going through the length of the member, but is going perpendicular to the main length of the member, you get bending. And why does that happen? It's because you end up getting compressive forces that are uh, concentrated along the top of that element, tensile forces that are being concentrated along the bottom of that element, and then they both decrease until zero once they hit the neutral axis of that element. Let me show this more concretely, okay? Say if you have this beam, look at the one on the left. It's a straight beam. When you apply a bending force, so when you have more tension, uh, a compression at the top and tension at the bottom, look at how points P and R along the top move closer together because the top surface is in compression. Look at how points Q and S move further apart because they're now in tension. You basically have a distribution of axial forces through the face that's not uniform, okay? Uh, shear stresses. Shear stresses are another type of stress that you get when you get two surfaces trying to move in opposite direction from each other. So as you can see, say on the right-hand side, if you have two elements and they're bolted together and you're trying to pull them apart or pulling them apart the other way, you get shear stress in those bolts because you're trying to cut through the bolts holding those two pieces together. Shear stress should also sound familiar because it's what's trying to be resisted, say, in reinforced concrete by the stirrups. Remember that when we covered reinforced concrete structures. I'm going to be providing you with an example of shear stress, a calculation example. It's going to be linked for you at the bottom in the description, so check it out. It's not complex. It's relatively simple, but you should be aware of it, okay? Next, bearing stress. I'm hoping this term is sounding familiar, especially if you did soils. Bearing stress is what you get when you have some type of concentrated load, say on a steel column coming down onto a footing, and that force coming through that column has the capacity of punching through, right? Of sinking into that support. So what you have to do is typically between a steel column and a concrete footing, you want to put a bearing plate so that you spread out, right? The load that's coming down so that you don't punch through it. Another example is say if you have a beam that's sitting on a concrete wall, the point load, the reaction coming from that beam hitting on the wall has to be spread out by a bearing plate. Hopefully this sounds familiar because you covered something very similar in the topic of soils. Remember that? That's the whole point of footings. Footings act as bearing plates between your whole structure and the soil below it, right? Because it spreads out those forces that are coming down onto that footing, onto the soil, depending on the soil's capacity to push back up. Uh, another item that I'd like to discuss with you, the last one in terms of failures, is buckling. Buckling happens when you have long, slender columns. So say, try say taking an uncooked spaghetti, a full one, and if you put a little bit of a force on it, it will buckle. It will take a new, non-straight shape with just a little bit of force on it. Then cut it, break it in half. What's left of that, try and applying the same force, you'll notice that it won't buckle out as much. You're gonna need a bit more force to get it to buckle out. And that's buckling. Buckling is the instance where for a certain slender element, 
when you reach a specific so-called buckling force, that member goes from being straight to being non-straight, no longer in equilibrium. Okay, and it's kind of a, it can be a rather catastrophic failure, even though it does not affect the uh, uh, the member itself, because it, once you take off the buckling load, it goes back to its shape. Buckling applies to construction for the purposes, say, of stud walls, right? The studs themselves are long and slender, so you have to block them. You have to install stud blocking between the studs to make sure they stay straight. That's true also for floor joists. Wood floor joists, right? That's why you put blocking between floor joists, because for beams, if you put a buck, uh, the right load on it and they're long and slender, they can buckle out of plane. And lastly, for the purposes of the reinforcing and reinforced concrete column, the longitudinal reinforcing gets reinforced with stirrups or ties to ensure that that reinforcing does not buckle on its own. Now, I want to talk a little bit about safety margins and the factors of safety, but what I'm going to do is actually link a video just about this so I don't have to rush through it. What is it? Why is this important? Here's the thing. When we build design structures, we build them out of some kind of material. And the purpose of these structures is to resist whatever loads, whatever forces we put on them. The materials used to build these structures deteriorate, right? <clears throat> also, we don't know with a certain degree of certainty all the time what the loads are gonna be on that structure. So the idea between a safe design and construction of buildings, of structures, is this. We recognize that the material we're going to use to build that structure will deteriorate over time. It's true, okay? So although we know, say, that a certain building material has a strength of X, as designers, we actually assume that that strength is maybe 80% of that. So we assume that the material we're going to be using is actually weaker than it is then we combine that with the fact that we can estimate what kind of loads we're going to be getting on that structure and that material. So say occupant loads or winds or snow or earthquakes. And then we increase those applied forces. So if we assume that there are going to be 100 people in a movie theater, we actually say, nope, we're going to pretend we're going to have 150 people in that movie theater. So the combination of us assuming that the material is actually weaker than it is and that the applied forces are actually more than they are provides a margin of safety, right, in ensuring that the design of that structure is appropriate and safe for the occupants. But I'll discuss this more in the video that's linked for you in the bottom. That's it. So I hope this overview of items related to structural properties of material is helpful. Don't forget to check out the additional videos that are linked for you in the description. I want to thank you so much for your time. Take care and have a lovely day.